The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today, we've got a guest who has a long term business that has managed to put down a couple of routes in a few specific areas that I think will be of quite a lot of interest to um, the listeners, Um, areas such as navigating um, how workplaces um, are running their financial responsibilities to their employees, aged care, as well as the good quality pillars of financial advice, such as life insurance and general financial advice. Um, Joining me today in person is David Gibson from Priority Advisory Group. Good morning, David. Good morning, Andrew. And David, as um, I spent some time earlier chatting to you about um, you know, why the hell you got into financial planning, because it wasn't the first thing you did, it'd be good for everyone to get a feel for, um, because we're now talking a 20-year career in financial planning, is yeah, that right? right. That's okay. Right. Um, but before then, you spent a lot of time fleeing Australia. Is that correct? So maybe you get a, a bit of an idea of what what drew you out of this country to go and work around the world in various roles? What brought you back? And what was the catalyst for waking up one day and going, that financial planning thing sounds like my rest of my life career? Okay. I was probably going to address that backwards, but uh, perhaps- that- oh, You can do that if you want. It's just hard to listen, right? So we can spin it backwards, can't we? We've got any- yeah. So Perhaps that would be okay. So uh, I joined a I joined Priority Advisory Group back in 2003, having located them myself. I was looking for a business succession opportunity, having identified that as a problem in the industry. Sorry, so and you literally was- in 2003, we had the wherewithal to identify business succession as as the avenue that you wanted to enter the industry. That's right. I was wow. I was looking to move from a corporate environment, which had been great, but into a very different role where I got to be a business owner to make policy rather than be subject to it, uh, to be uh, in, in influence, an influencer in, uh, in most aspects of the, of the business through uh, not only what I was doing with the board, but through the role that I played in the business. Because prior to that, you were with uh, National Australia Bank, our financial markets. So is that right? Yeah, that's right. I was with them for over 20 years, around 20 years in financial markets, and it was financial markets that took me overseas. So originally, it started just before our currency floated and our Financial markets became more flexible and more interesting. Shout out to PK and uh, Mr. Hawk. <laughs> yes. Thanks for deregulating. <laughs> yes, it was a great one. I actually met Paul Keating once and I thanked him for both careers because I figure that uh, compulsory superannuation had a fair bit to do with the second one growing the way it, uh, the way it did. Well, I'd safely say iron ore and compulsory superannuation is the reason we live at lifestyle we do in this country. Yeah, I think that's got a lot to do with it. So I became interested in international banking. I wanted to live and work in other parts of the world. My foray into that was through a, what is now a graduate scheme, but effectively a, an international banking traineeship. That took me to Melbourne initially. I landed in Melbourne in the foreign exchange area just before the currency floated, and I didn't leave financial markets after that. Can I ask a self-indulgent question? So when it was a fixed currency, what the hell did the currency trader do? Other currencies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. 
So with the respect to the Australian dollar, we had people that were doing estimates of what the trade weight index was so they could estimate what the, what the value should be because outside of Australia, it did float. And then it came back to Australia with sometimes a, a distorted value. Gotcha. Uh, so to accelerate the training, uh, I was sent to Singapore just to be in an offshore market. I came back to Melbourne uh, and continued there for another nine or 10 months and then went off to Tokyo because as Australia allowed foreign banks in, Australian banks were allowed to open in foreign shores. So Tokyo was had been a representative office. It became a full branch. I was among the, the initial team that, uh, that ran the financial markets area there. After a couple of years, I moved on looking to develop my career further. But as it turned out, I stayed in financial markets, initially in Sydney. Then I went back to Singapore for a couple of years uh, and via Brisbane, learning some new things about what the National Australia Bank was doing with agribusiness and business banking clients across to New Zealand to take the concepts across and to try to translate them into uh, into the way the markets work there. So uh, New Zealand, you went across um, 98. Yes. Um, and uh, just as a, an aside, what's your observations of the, the New Zealand market? And you, you've obviously, you were there for three and a half years, so you've got an affinity with, with how it's put together. It's really learnings. One of the things that was different about New Zealand was that the banks in New Zealand got the pick of the graduates. It was a really desired career path for high grade graduates coming out of the university. So it was a Bank of New Zealand rather than NAB, but owned by NAB. Uh, and we got really uh, high, highly qualified, motivated, well-educated uh, people coming in. So it was a, not to say that Australia wasn't, but it was far more, I guess, widespread throughout the organisation. So that was a difference. Other than that, there was some work that was being done in particular by National Australia Bank in Australia with middle market clients that had not been taken up by anybody across there. So there were some new concepts in financial risk management. So currency and interest rate risk management primarily. And we're talking about risk offsets, not risk onset or taking. So it was a desire to give people outcomes that, uh, that helped their business to uh, to be healthy and look in 1997 we had a, a pretty pretty sharp currency uh, um, uh, correction globally that would have been a bit of fun and it probably was a bit of a, a precursor to um, you know some of your time in financial advice you've had the GFC um, uh, you came in just after the September 11 effectively um, we've had COVID so um, and you've actually were well, let me have a look here scrolling back this will date you yep uh, you were the 1987 uh, involved in 1987 as well so. Um, uh, you've you've seen a few of these dips, and it is human nature, isn't it? It is. 1987 was uh, was one of the biggest events in currency markets because it was the so-called Plaza Accord, where there was a coordinated effort to drive down the value of the US dollar, uh, and it continued for for quite some time. There Do you was- feel that that's what the 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 in, the potentially incoming um, uh, regime in in Washington wants to do to stimulate their manufacturing? That's an interesting one. I guess there's been a fair bit of speculation about what might happen if uh, if um, Donald Trump becomes president again. Uh, I think that he'll probably make his uh, his thoughts or wishes increasingly strongly known. I don't want to really speculate about that at this stage. Uh, no worries. I was uh, yet again. That was mainly indulgent for me. It's uh, we're trying not to date these, and they're I'm just uh, curious. Curious. Is, look, he's giving me the laser beam eyes, going rocks. We're trying not to date these podcasts, and you're talking about a contemporary thing. So. So clearly, after working in financial markets for too long, you had uh, two problems. One was that you didn't own National Australia Bank and you couldn't uh, you couldn't run it. The other one was you clearly had too much money and you you wanted to potentially take a step backwards in income and become a financial planner. So, what happened in two thousand and three? What was the how was the speed dating of looking for this? And, the speed, and, the speed dating, interesting way of, of thinking about it. I did come out of National Australia Bank with a redundancy package, and it was a fairly handsome one after having been there for over twenty years. So. My desire to be an investor was, was was funded effectively. Then it was just a matter of could I find a business that wanted to bring a successor in, uh, that wanted an investor, and that was really progressive in their thinking about how to get it done. I also needed some mentoring because I took some time out after after uh, the redundancy package. I did the old eight subject eight subject DFP, but I really needed help with the final project, being the being the full SOA. And I really wanted to work out how to translate what I had learned through a relatively close connection in middle markets between the business and the personal wealth of the business owners and actual personal financial advice. So 
that was the driver. That was the thing that propelled me. And what I did was really just phone a lot of what I thought were small practices. I didn't know anything about the industry in terms of dealer groups and branding, etc. So if I thought it was a small business and it might have a succession problem, I just called the owner, asked for 20 or 30 minutes of their time, offered to buy them a coffee and asked about their business if they would let me. Well, I can tell you what's going through the financial planner's mind, right? So you, you, you're uh, you're not an old guy. You've just had uh, a 20-year redundancy from National Australia Bank. You're like literally the perfect client. So uh, I imagine when you went in there asking, can you join the firm, it would have been pretty hard for them not to say, but only after I do your financial plan. <laughs> well, they didn't go straight there. One of the things that propelled me to do the diploma to start with was I thought that at least I could manage my own personal finances a bit better. Yep. I hadn't done a terrible job. I had at least not spent everything I earned, but I hadn't really gained a lot of knowledge other than what I gained through the diploma about how to manage personal finance and where some of the benefits and advantages were. So adding to the financial markets, risk management, experience, some insights into personal finance, how superannuation works, why life insurance is important and other aspects of financial planning, how you can actually help make a difference for other people. I was learning about how to make a difference for myself at the same time. So the key thing was wanting to be a a business owner. I thought about it as being self-employed, but not by myself. So uh, the mentoring was- uh, Interesting, good comment. What I found was a fair, uh, quite a variety of, uh, of approaches when I, when I made those calls. So some didn't want to talk about it. Um, some didn't make the time, but those that did had varying expectations. And some were quite realistic about bringing me in as an employee. Um, I didn't know at that stage where I, whether I definitely wanted to be a financial planner facing clients or whether, whether I wanted to be a practice manager. But I thought that a good start would be para planning to hone some technical skills. So being an employee, getting some mentoring into how to deal with clients face-to-face on their personal finances was, was key. Some of them were realistic about, uh, about bringing me in as, a, as an employee and letting me find a way to become a, a, a part owner. Some were completely what I would term unrealistic. So the example of that was, sure, you can rent some of our space. We'll pay you for some of the clients that you can bring in. And later on, if it all works out, you can buy some of the client base from us, including some of the ones that you brought in. I don't think that the problem of succession that I had read about in the industry was really well recognized or had been realistically thought about broadly, just from a fairly narrow, admittedly, sample that I had taken. The reason I joined Priority Advisory Group, or Priority Planners as it was known then, was through my search I found a fellow that I used to work with at National Australia Bank in financial markets, a guy named Ian Burt. I knew him. I had a lot of respect for him. I recognized that he would have selected a good business to be in. So I did the same thing. Could I buy you a cup of coffee and have 20 or 30 minutes of your time talk about the business that you're in? I didn't know at the stage that he wasn't a shareholder. Didn't matter. Just wanted his insight. At the same time, I met Larry Fingelson, who had beat me into the business by about a year, and he was very progressive and had been pushing the two founders who were 50-50 owners to not only plan for succession, but to let it happen. And the let it happen was the thing that was probably the, the, the greatest breakthrough for me. They were very much on board with, yes, we do need to succeed ourselves if we are going to ever get out and retire with our capital. So initially, the plan was for me to succeed one of the founders. As it turned out, uh, I became a shareholder by funding the first acquisition. Oh, how long after you started there did that happen? I'm trying to recall exactly what it was. About two and a half years. Okay. So we'd had a pretty good look at each other by then. Yeah. I had done some power planning. I'd spent a lot of time in client meetings. So I went to the sorts of things that was associated planners was the dealer group yep. at the time induction programs and other programs that they that they ran. So I got a good insight into who we were all licensed through, not just who are the guys that I get to know. There were study groups I got included in. So I met a lot of the other people who spoke for the business that I had joined. Uh, all very encouraging, but a great period of you know, due diligence, if you think of it that way. So I became the succession, uh, the capital for an acquisition. I became the succession plan for the advisor that had owned that business. And what business was that? Forgotten the name of the business. It's terrible, isn't it? The advisor was a fellow named Derwood McGill, who had come to Australia as an entertainer uh, and was very, very bright. Found his way into financial advice because his wife wanted him to get a real job, but he also wanted to be a a businessman, very entrepreneurial. As it happened, he died Oh, fairly suddenly, not very long after that acquisition. So I was in the process of being 
introduced to some of his clients. I won't mention their names, but some of them are very funny comedians of some note, uh, and others, of course. But when he died, I had to very quickly get in front of them wow, um, and try to convey some confidence. And that was not really the way you would play a succession. <laughs> it wasn't planned to be that way, um, but it got, um, it got rushed because of that. Well, that's one side of the interpretation of, of uh, what's happened to you. The other side of it is, is that um, for his family, uh, he actually exercised this and preserved some capital prior to his unfortunate passing, mm, yeah. which, you know, if two or three years later wouldn't have been the case. So yeah. a bit bittersweet, I suppose, in that regard. And um, so then you've, you've, you've effectively, uh, you've backdoor listed your equity in priority uh, advisory group. Is that what we're saying here? Yes, I uh, became a shareholder of just over twenty percent of the firm at that stage. Uh, the, the shareholding was was uneven because the succession was unevenly timed. Yep, that was fine. Um, we were quite clear on differentiating the role in the business that you have, and your as an employee, and the role that you might have if you have the appetite and the capital as an investor. So they don't have to be the same thing. It was a proprietary limited company by shares right from the very beginning. So there was a fairly good bit of foresight back in 1987. And, uh, and that made it fairly, uh, fairly simple because I was then able to take on as much as I could afford and had an appetite for, yep. which also helped the succession. But it also gave me the 20% that was critical. It gave me a seat at the table as a board member and um, an insight into the, into the running of the business. The ability, I think I already said, but I'll repeat to make policy rather than be subject you, to it. You did. And so two and a half years in, you got the wish of becoming a business owner. Yeah. So, um, and outside of um, doing that, I, I read your bio, you've been married for 30 something years. Is that right? It's coming up to 42. Congratulations. One of my, one of my magic numbers, by the way. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Well, 42, isn't that the um, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy number? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. nodding. Kieran, put the links. <laughs> We get a couple of links to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And what, what should we always bring? A towel. <laughs> so if, we, if you know, you know, if you're listening. Yeah. Um, so um, outside of that, you've got a, a couple of adult children um, based here in Sydney. Um, and from talking to you, um, uh, you guys are only just getting started with this, this business. Is that right? Well, only just getting started. As far as the growth the plan. Expansion. Yeah. It, it, it has expanded a couple of times. So after that first acquisition that I mentioned, there were another couple of sort of one-man businesses, both in the same licensee group at the time. Which was still AP or was it a it move was, to Fortnum? It was still Associated Planners yeah. at the time, but not long before the move to Fortnum. So there were one-man businesses that were dealing with having been successful and really wrestling with how to get the help they needed, more in support roles than other, than other advisor roles. But um, it did provide for them to have some uh, ownership in the overall business as well as some uh, ability to exit some of the some of the capital. And then the latest uh, growth is under a year old. So we merged with a business that was about the same size in Chatswood, same licensee group, same um, capital partner. And that has very quickly uh, increased our scale. We were profitable and sustainable beforehand. I would say that... Um, we're 37 years old. There's probably another 37 years or more in it now. Perfect. Perfect. And so when I'm sort of talking about the, the engine room, um, maybe give me a bit of a feel of, of the engine room that you, you've come into mm -hmm. um, prior to the most recent merger, because we were talking about um, the, your role. So your client, your client facing, you've spent time on, a, on the board. Uh, you're now off the board, but so you, you've done the running of the business. But, but your firm priority has had a person in that general management uh, administration head for, for some years. Yeah. Um, and right now, you've uh, who, who is running the operations of the business, and or is it one or two people? Um, and or maybe take a step back. How, how many? What's the headcount currently of the business? The headcount currently is thirty. Thirty people. So that's fifteen advisors and. 15 support. So 15 AR, 15 support. And within that support, um, power planning, those sorts of things? Power planning is outsourced. Okay. So, you, so you're outsourcing your, your power planning. Um, yeah. Any other facets of outsourcing? Yeah, we use some, uh, we do uh, uh, outsource a, a fair bit of 
administration work. Yep. So we have client relationship managers with us uh, who do take the lion's share of the calls from clients, particularly when they're looking for information rather than what should I do. They do implementation work, but a lot of the other um, more administrative style work, preparing uh, reports for reviews, uh, sending meeting confirmations out with financial services guides and, and other what you should bring or what you should think about before you come to the meeting, those sorts of things are um, uh, outsourced. So within that number of 30, that, that excludes the outsourcing component. Is that no, right? it does include. does include. Okay. So we've got a roughly – so if you're out there listening – um, uh, from an advice perspective, there's roughly a one-to-one ratio when you when you think about it, as far as uh, the advisor's time versus the 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 administration time, and and so and who's running the the, the back office? Well, the back office is sort of split. The, the management of the of the practice overall is split into uh, what we term an office manager, who is um, has a human resources background and is primary driver for keeping track of who's on leave, who's around, yep. uh, who's going to be available to answer the phones, who's working from home, who's in the office. Uh, the, human resor- the, the uh, human resources systems that we use for leave tracking, et cetera. What do you use, by the way? I like to get a bit of a tech stack there. Mm. We, we'll include it in the links. <laughs> <laughs> we'll include it in the links. Here, I've sprung that on him. And, uh, well, it's good to know that you haven't been heavily uh, involved in the, the so, HR uh, problems. Yeah. I won't say that that's not about to change, but my ADP payroll is, uh, has been the, Got the, the main thing for leave management. Got it. So. Got it. Uh, then the, the back office, if you like, or practice management is, um, is fine and operational management. Uh, and operational management being the what do you do other than meet with clients? Well, it's pretty much everything else. Well, delivery of, of the service. Del- and who have you got running both those businesses? So the office manager is Charmaine Israel and the uh, the business manager or the, the, the operations manager rather is Nicole Herman. And how long has Nicole been in that role? That's a good question. I was wrestling with, has it been nine years? Has it been eight? Has it been 12 there's strong tenure and loyalty there, and she knows the business inside and out, I, pro- I guess, are probably the fairest points and, that I would make. And Charmaine's been there around 10 years as well. And you mentioned recently that the most recent, um, uh, I suppose, merger was within the same licensee, so that's not problematic. But, um, you know, uh, things like tech tech uh, stacks, things like, you know, other business disciplines, mm-hmm. it's all good and well when the leaders of the business, the C-suite, have these great ideas about what are the sort of clients we want to serve and what do we want to do? But, geez, it's hard to implement. And it's hard to implement at a price point that's palatable to the consumer, so palatable to the stakeholders, yes. of which you've got a stakeholder, which is a capital partner. Yes. So um, how are you structured? So you've got the 15 advisors. Do they operate in pods? Um, what would be you know, what would be the OV company retained client number? Great question. I wish I had counted that out approximately to be asked. Uh, there are over a thousand actively yeah. managed clients. Yeah, I figure that. So, 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 um, it, each one of your advisors is probably looking after somewhere in the vicinity of circa one hundred family units. Some more, some less. Would that be right? So, there are some more, and there are some less, and that's partly because there is some transition happening. There are. I'm one person that has moved from five days a week to four days a week to now three days a week. There is another. Uh, advisor there who's done the same. Yeah. So there has been some transitioning of of clients. There have been a, a couple of retirements recently. Um, you think there's not much turnover in the advisor team, but uh, but when you look back, it's the end of 2022 was uh, was one retirement where uh, transition of, uh, of client relationships had to be fairly rapid because that decision was reached in a fairly short space of time, and the other one retired. Uh, about eighteen months before that, and, but there was time to plan for for that. So right. it was a, a a more gradual, I suppose, warmer handover and early collaboration. So now we have uh, we have people who were engaged in workplace financial advice, taking where people move from being uh, clients because they're a member of a of a maybe a default fund that their yep. employer has uh, yep. has set up for them into being personal clients. Then there is a group of advisors that has been taking on that sort of work for for quite a while. Yep, they have always had a uh, sorry. They lifestyle was the other business that we merged in with. They had always had a private clients business. It wasn't as large, whereas Priority Advisory Group pre merger was more private clients uh, and less of, um, of of any other aspect. 
The specialties, we don't actually work in pods, but there are a couple of specializations. So one is aged care. Yep. There are two people who are specializing in that, uh, whereas primarily before we used to find ourselves falling into it through client needs and needing to upskill ourselves or gain the knowledge from somewhere. Very quickly, we have developed deep knowledge and we'll continue to do that. So, the- so because we're going to get, you've got four four specifics on your website there at aged care mm-hmm. before we get into in, into um that which I, I do want to dwell on um what's the type of clients that you uh that you look after today and where do you think that's moving towards i think that's going to move more towards those sorts of specialties i think there'll be specialized continue both in the specialization in aged care yep the business Founded by two people, those two people were life insurance advisors. And that was in 80, 87. Always been a strong part of the business and yep. continues to be. Yep. There is the workplace financial advice, which has moved from the old corporate super model to a fee-for-service um, model where we've just helped. Well, let's it. drill down on that. So <laughs> for people who are old enough to remember, the corporate superannuation was a was quite a big facet of financial advice, especially in the first 15 years of compulsory super. Mm -hmm. And it was very much, uh, you did the exercise um, and you did the occasional seminar, uh, sat in the employer's office and hopefully someone came in and asked you a question. But now you're charging the employer fees and having more structure. Maybe give us a bit of an idea of what your practice does to deliver to an employer. What it used to do was, as you say, do some seminars, make yourself available, and quite often it was two or three of us would make ourselves available, depending on the size of the employee group, to meet one-on-one with the objective of helping them to gain them that they could from the superannuation plan that they were in, or potentially life insurances. Other stuff. Or, yeah. Other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Group, group salary continuance, that sort of thing, yeah. things that could benefit them or make them more secure. Lifestyle Financial Services was doing the same, they were... Um, Did you run into each other as competitors? Not really. We knew each other. Okay. Because we're both in chats when we weren't that far apart. And then once we were part of the same group, we had at conferences, et cetera, professional development days. Where there was differentiation, I don't know, but they were definitely delivering advice, looking to benefit the the members of uh, of employee, uh, sorry, employer superannuation plans, as were we. They were bigger in it. Because now, instead of, titling yourself um, sort of uh, group insurance or employer superannuation, your tagline is your outsourced workplace benefit specialist, mm-hmm. which very much is a service orientated value add to the employer. Yes. It is around what financial planners do though, superannuation, life insurance, and it is around helping the employees to understand and to gain the most benefit that they can or the most security that they can depending on whether it's superannuation, group life cover or both. And and how many people out of your advisor force um, uh, are, are specialising in that facet of, of of your business? Well, there are three, four, beg your pardon, continually. It's recently grown from three to four, continually uh, involved in it. However, there are three or four others who are taking referrals where employees move beyond. Of course, they are the employee plan to wanting to be personal. I fixed it. Which sounds like a pretty good way to have like an, a client receivable column, right? So so the way I'm looking at it, you're getting paid by the employer mm-hmm. to deliver a goods and services to the employer with the byproduct that if an employee leaves that person, they've probably got a chance of becoming a private wealth client of yours. Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah, which which is great, right? That's a great funnel to have from the client perspective. Um, and you also mentioned that you do life insurance. Yes. Which you do, but you do aged care. Now, there's a conundrum because they're oil and water in that life insurance typically is for people at a different life stage to aged care. So have you got specific specialities for life insurance in, in, in the uh, group? Yes, we do. And there are, there is, well, there's one advisor that is solely life insurance, knows it deeply, and there are a couple of others who are actively involved in uh, in life insurance as a I guess a major specialty rather than a, a, a primary driver or sole driver. So does that mean if I'm an advisor in your group or I'm an aspiring advisor to join your group because I like the concept of having clients sort of generated for me and I don't do much life insurance that when I got to the juncture of doing a plan for a couple that required specific specialist life insurance, 
I would then lean on the expertise of my colleague. Is that how it works? Yes, and it's exactly what I do. So because of my background, I'm quite happy to have a risk management conversation. But when it comes to relationships in the life insurance industry, when it comes to deep knowledge of the product, I just don't have it. And I, and I have not really had the drive to develop that. I recognize it, I respect it, but it's not me. So I do lean on my colleagues who have that specialty. And that, that answers my question that everyone, everyone's an employee of the group and it's all for one, one for all as far as client centric. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, if we yeah, if one succeed, well, if we all succeed, we all succeed. To yep. put it stupidly, I suppose. But but uh, and 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 you mentioned you outsource your para planning. Is that on a per plan basis? Yes, it is. It's a pay per plan, and it's really it's it's time based as you'd expect. So yep. complex complex is more expensive than simple. Yeah, but it does dip into people who specialise in that uh, and are efficient in it. And. From a business ownership perspective, you've got a pretty good idea of what that's going to cost in a year when you work out the number of clients you have to do uh, retention uh, plans for and your aspiration for new business growth. Now, mm. um, I will put this this on you. I didn't ask you earlier, what is the growth aspirations for organic growth for your firm? Well, organic growth's always been a significant part of it. I, mean, I have talked about some mergers and acquisitions because we were looking to to build some scale. We were looking to help some people. Well, you're 30 succession. people. You're not small. No, we're not small. Um the, uh, the the latest uh, merger was really about um, about getting some scale efficiencies, and what uh, were they? So so scale efficiencies is a, is a, is definitely would be on the sticker. Mm-hmm. But does that effectively, as a stakeholder of the business which you are, what what cost synergies did you obtain, and what what speciality sort of synergies have you got? Well, one of them, of course, is space. Yeah, uh, their firm, the other firm, had um, had space. Uh, we needed it. We'd run out of a lease, and the building manager was being stick about uh, about its renewal. So we availed ourselves of the space, moved in. There you go. That's a simple one. What else? So we had separate databases, uh, but we shared meeting rooms and a kitchen. So yep. we got to we got to know everyone personally uh, before the firms uh, formally merged. Really? So you moved in and, and cohabitated um, whilst you were dating. You de facto. Absolutely. Yeah. How long was this de facto relationship? And what did the parents think of this? <laughs> well, I think the parents were fairly happy. We've only we've only had positive feedback, uh, and the group is a really good group. I mean, we as we got to know them, we got we got to to, to respect their yeah. their, their capabilities. We, we confidence in being able to move clients around if we had to. Uh, ultimately, to transition clients for biz, for advisors like me who are scabbed or ultimately exiting. So the, the the confidence is 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 a critical part, and we felt that um, we felt that there was alignment of culture there. So that made it relatively simple. But spending time together, rather than just having some conversations, really helps to uh, to to meld that and and build uh, and build that trust and confidence. It's a genuine de facto relationship. You, I mean, within the the year or so, you figured out who put out the bins and and uh, who washed the dishes and. Um, I think when we're going to talk about culture and 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 the right type of or the type of people that that you guys like to retain and attract, um, I think that's a really interesting thing, and that's probably one of the first uh, merger and acquisition stories I've had where they've actually cohabitated, um, at least where they've cohabitated and also been married. Right? There's probably been some before where they've done that, and someone's come into work the next day, and um, their stuff's been on the front lawn. Um, so uh, other things, um, your your license now by by Fortner. That's right. Um, and uh, what? I mean, you're at a scale, and I asked this question, and yeah. um, you know, the, the the good team at Fortnum, which is also now being renamed, yes. um, uh, will probably hate me for asking it, but you're at a scale where you could probably be self licensed. Why, why is it that? Um, why is it that 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 you you're um, uh, you're picking and sticking with with Fortnum, which by the way have great practices. Well, the way I think of it is that we've really stuck along the way with the people that we came to know, rely on, and have a lot of faith in. So we started with Associated Planners. That was headed up by Ray Miles. Ray Miles and Associated Planners, through acquisition of Challenges Financial Planning Business, became Genesis. Then, ultimately, Ray ended up starting up Fortnum, spoke to the people that he knew best, and we ended up staying with Ray and the research people that he had around him that uh, we had become very confident in. So we didn't feel as though there was any change there. We had contemplated in the past whether to move to our own license. 
we decided that we didn't want to run a license. We just decided that we're an advice business and that was pretty much all we wanted to do. That's not a dead issue, but it's it's not likely unless yes. unless we really couldn't provide the advice that our client base needed. I don't see us I don't see us moving on. And you mentioned then that one of the um, uh, decision pieces that you uh, took into consideration was the research coming across, mm-hmm. which leads me to um, now uh, investment because you have a personal and family wealth division. It's one of the four um, service offerings. Um, clearly, you're investing a fair bit of money for people. Yes. Um, how do you do that? Do you have an SMA, an IMA? What's what's the philosophy for for the the group? Well, right back from the start, there were research team developed model portfolios. Yeah. So for those who didn't want to select and blend managers, fund managers or listed products and fund managers themselves, you could adopt a model portfolio and they tracked their performance and the performance was sound. Yep. Generally very positive from a from a client experience perspective. When the research team or the core of that research team established a business that does do managed accounts, we adopted them fairly Early on, because we what, had, what year was that roughly? Two thousand and eleven. Okay, yeah, that's early doors for stuff like that. Yeah, um, and that the byproduct of that decision is from an operational and review um, uh, component. It, it it drives some efficiencies into your business. Look, it certainly does, but that wouldn't hang together if it wasn't a good client experience as well. So we've been lucky in that we already had the experience. We weren't. 100% model portfolio adopters, but we're, it was always a very strong reference for us and it was delivering good results. So having those portfolios actually implemented, having asset allocation adjusted, research-driven, active decisions being made without having to write records of advice, without the time delay that's involved in that, without the trading delays that are involved in that and the risk to clients that that includes, was going to be a positive step for us. A secondary benefit, of course, is that it is very efficient for the business. But there was, from both perspectives, the client perspective and the business perspective, some of the small adjustment advice documents were real kind of time wasters and not really value adders. Requirements, yes, but clients never appreciated them. So getting good results without being interrupted all the time, being able to spend more time on client interactions in client meetings was seen as the positive for the business more than anything else. And of course, there was a whole lot of legacy portfolio portfolios, which we didn't just tear up and reform. Yep. It, nothing that is the same suits everybody. So whether it's a conservative managed portfolio or a high growth managed portfolio, a managed portfolio, a managed account isn't going to be right for every client. So we do have some legacy and we do have some adjustments around, you know, maybe a managed account as a core with some satellites driven by specific interests that a client may have uh, or a liquidity need. Yep. Uh, so there's always been uh, working around that, but we're, um, we've been adopters on the basis that there's been good client experience in it. So 12 or 13 years down the track, we're very happy with the experience that clients have had and that we have increasingly had through the efficiencies we've gained. Probably is an attractive proposition for, I think you mentioned you, you absorbed some one-man pe- operations coming in, getting those efficiencies. As of today, right, right now, um, who, who helps you power those up? What, what's, what, what are the sorts of companies that you, you guys get good support from? Well, firstly, it's driven by what's approved. <laughs> so the first one that was approved by Fortnum was a group called Innova Asset Management, which, as I mentioned, was formed out of the core of the research team beforehand. Core of, but added. Yep. Um, very bright people, um, actuarial input, research input that was independent. Uh, and then later on, as we... Uh, found a capital partner in AZNGA. We got to learn about Azimut's capabilities and what they brought to Australia in their Sustante managed portfolios. Then there were some other needs that weren't met initially by uh, by those two firms, such as um, ESG. Yep. And so people like Lonsec, um had portfolios like that. And I think that's going to increase. And of course, the, the, uh, the enlarged Fortnum group, now known as Entirety, does have both a research team and a managed account team. So we will learn more about that uh, and have some more options available to, to clients. And you um, you kind of just opened the door up to um, uh, another, another, I suppose, flavor of, of your business is you have a capital partner in AZNGA. Um, when did that come about? 
came about eight and a half years ago. I guess the conversation started before eight and a half years ago because we're about eight and a half years into being a part of AZNGA. That came out of personal connections. Uh, our previous CEO, Larry Fingelson, had a personal connection with someone who said you need to talk to Paul Barrett about what he's doing. AZNGA through Paul had a succession plan, of, uh, I guess a corporatization of sorts that looked very much like a model that we had been part of trying to develop uh, with Ray at, at Fortnum, but he had the added backing of someone with um, an appetite and the capital. So what? So from that perspective, because it wasn't as if you weren't already looking to grow in organically, mm-hmm. you know, we're now eight and a half years into that relationship. And for people who know that, I've, I've also got an involvement in, in that business as well. Um uh, has it helped you facilitate some of those transactions? And has, you know, I asked someone a while ago who was part of that group and they were fiercely independent and they loved being self-employed, but you go from that, but you've got a board now. <laughs> yes, we you, do. You've got a report from once a quarter or once a month. And how did that transition? It's good having the capital, but yeah. you wake up and have to report. How did that go for you? Well, I guess the that was probably the thing that we were most nervous about was you know, from being self-drivers to being effectively corporatized again. Yeah, you're reporting uh, up. I mean, it's it's sure it's not a full takeover, but you know these people are um, they're they're facilitating capital for for succession. They're facilitating capital to help you acquire things. Yeah, they want to know what's going on with your business every month. True. I think selfishly to begin with, there was the founder that I was coming in to succeed was still in the business with the vast majority of his capital. Right. Others of us had no idea how we would ever exit some of our capital. Uh, AZNGA came in with a program that that gave you some capital up front, but incentivized you to keep the business profitable and successful. Correct. What they then added through their involvement on the board with people like me stepping off was rigor, always looking. We won't mess about with your business. We won't get involved unless we really have to. We'll leave you to run it. But there will be the rigor of having to report regularly, talk about what's going on, talk about why things are up or down. And it's always been a variable business. I mean, new clients don't line up you know, for a month or whatever, whatever number you yep. might want. Um, they come in fits and starts. Uh, thankfully for us, not too many clients leave, but some do. And of course, people don't last forever. So there are there are natural changes that you can't really regulate, but if it's more than that, they want to know, and you and you need to know your business well enough to be able to talk to that. And what I've what I've sort of observed um, from third party and also directly is that you can't have blind spots because they they've got a torch, right? And 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 uh, you know, like the, the the avatar of a financial planner is normally optimistic. So when you rip in there, you want to talk about all the positive things, um, but it is very useful having someone in there. Yeah, but what about that bit? And you're like, damn! <laughs> I didn't think you bring it up every month. So, so yeah, that was that's. I suppose I'm, I'm demystifying the cadence of of that there. Um, but you're eight and a half years in, and it has so you, that facilitated that initial succession or one part of the succession plan. Mm-hmm. But as we speak now, I'm looking at your website. You've got some young people on the website coming through. Um, you've got some young at heart people as well. Um, how are you going about sort of replicating that? For the next generation, I guess that's the tricky thing. We're, we're always interested in people coming in who are looking to be business owners or thinking like business owners from the start, and then potentially having you know the, the capacity as well as the appetite to to own a portion of the business. I think it's the thinking like an owner that's uh, that's critical. Um, but then from there, it, I don't think it needs to matter whether you're a practice manager, a para planner, a, a, an earlier stage advisor or a later stage advisor, if you've got the appetite and you want to be an investor, then be an investor Let the, and have the business allow those people to be investors in it because you're either influencing the top line or you're influencing the bottom line, sometimes both. So why not have a stake? I don't know sure that's successful we're in this podcast, Kieran, but um, that's a great line. And you know what? The whole purpose of highlighting the engine room is that it's not just about the frontline advisors becoming owners. You're exactly right. If you've got everyone working on the business and their efficiencies, you're all pushing ahead. Yeah. And the most successful firms that I get the privilege of interviewing, yeah, they're, they're general manager, their operations, they're, they're, they have a share in the game. Yeah. 
and that's what you've developed in your business. Is that right? That's right. And historically, that has been the case. I don't know the full shareholding now. It might not necessarily be the case. It might just be the advisors, but the thinking is along those lines, has been historically, and there's no reason for that not to continue. Well, it's it's the, it's, it's, it's the way of the future. Yeah. So other other quick things. So um, uh, any technology that you utilize um, that uh, that you'd like to highlight? What's the technology? Because um, being in Fortnum, you've got the X plan. Um, what do you do for client um, uh, for the client aspect of the, the transaction? So more recently, we've adopted Salesforce through a group called Captegra. Yep. So that is. It is a client relationship management system. It's also a workflow control system. So we're looking primarily for for Captegra as well, Kieran. Thanks. Primarily for the efficiencies that systematic workflows can do. Yep. That doesn't take away from the nature of the conversation you have with a client you meet for the first time or for the hundredth time. Yep. But it does influence the way things get done. They don't fall through the cracks. They get done by the right people at the right time. And the work can be tracked. So if someone calls and says, you know, how are things going with that thing we talked about last week or last month, you are able to find that out very quickly. Uh, but you're also, as a as a business owner, as an advisor, as someone interested in getting the advice to the client, able to be confident that it's going to happen in a in a timely fashion. So that's um that's a move away from whole a whole lot of greater reliance on X plan, which does also have um, workflow systems, we never became very good at that. Uh, so we've um, we've realised that we need to be very good with the Salesforce driven workflows, and it will be the primary database for client relationship management. And did that also incorporate the uh, the workplace um, employee benefits uh, program and the aged care, or are they separate for the workflow? Yes, absolutely. Um, advice is advice. Um, there are commonalities in the in the process, uh, and so the, the workflows can handle uh, what comes out of that. Not necessarily every conversation you have with someone who's a member of an employer super fund or the default fund that an employer has engaged, but uh, the, the, the workflow for anyone that comes out of that needing personal advice, um, needing advice on aged care for their parents or their partner, or life insurance advice that's personal rather than group, the, the the workflow becomes very uh, very similar in terms of uh, the the steps that are taken. And when you're um sort of, oh, thank you for giving me a bit of insights into sort of how the business works. Um, and I didn't realise you were down to three days a week. Thank you for coming in. Is this one of the three days, or is this one of your days off? It is, but I would have made an exception. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. thank you very much. And a big shout out to Danny Visser, who's uh, <laughs> who helped facilitate today. Um, is you know, where we are in financial planning is we've got a decreasing talent pool of uh, advisors. We've got an ever-increasing requirement and, and pool of clients. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of um, a, a war on talent, so to speak, at, mm-hmm. at various levels within a, within a, a group. You're, you're a Sydney-based group. You're in Chatswood. For, for, for people who don't know, Sydney is um, about four or five stops on a very efficient train north. Of the city, it's a, it's a, it's a large uh, area, and the North Shore of Sydney. But I imagine your clients are from all over Sydney. Would that be from all over Australia? Maybe they are. the The, the first two founders uh, recognised that their target client base was going to be through their network, which was very largely white collar corporate or entrepreneur. And yeah. it largely has remained that way. But of course, as you gain the confidence of clients, they refer their friends and and family. And if a prospect can benefit from our advice to the extent that we're worth paying for the advice on a commercial level, then we'll take care of them. Yeah, of course. And that's been a big source of the organic growth. And post-COVID, is everyone back in the office or are you running a hybrid? It's it's running hybrid. Uh, I personally am in the office because I I just am made that way. I like the division between um, home and work, Uh, being able to shut off at least to a degree as I walk away from uh, from the office is uh, is helpful for me. Did I mention but- 42 years of marriage? So <laughs> for those people there that need a little bit of uh, relationship counselling, there's a tip for you. Yeah, better or worse, but not lunch. You know, I've heard those sayings <laughs> as well. <laughs> Therein lies a challenge for uh, for when we retire. Anyway, let's 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 move on from that. Um, 
People do work from home, and there are reasons for that. There are there are responsibilities around you know picking up children, yeah. or getting them to school, or extracurricular activities, that sort of thing. We've always exercised a great deal of flexibility. So, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier on, but from the time I moved out of the corporate, where I was changing my kids' birth dates so that you know I could fit in with what was required of me work wise, I didn't miss anything. Once I joined financial planning through Priority, I was at every major school event, but I gave back. I worked weekends and long days yeah, and that yeah. sort of thing, but the flexibility was really valuable. So that's morphed now into working from home, I think, but the flexibility is, I think, still the the, the, the key kicker there. And if it means that people are more comfortable, more loyal um, and stay, then you know we're more than happy to, to, to facilitate that. I personally like having people around me, Yeah, but I get it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Look, and, and um, I remember uh, I was at I was a, a wee financial planner in nineteen eighty eight or no, no ninety eight or ninety nine, and and I went to a PD day, and I was um, without children. I think my first uh, well, I don't know my first child had come in two thousand and four, um, and they did a survey of the most time consuming task uh, that you do every day, and you know I thought it might have been prospecting or writing plans. And it came back picking up and dropping off your children from school. <laughs> and I've gone, oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, back then that was a, a choice you had to make between your partners, who was doing it, how it was working. But now there's more flexibility and technology enables that. So yeah, um, with the future generation of your business, given that your personal um, choice is that you like people around, is that does that mean that if... Uh, you were to look to take on people to work or new team members mm-hmm. that that you'd like to have a sort of them in around that that Sydney orientated um, location. Well, if I was able to call it all by myself, I would want to at least get to know them. No one listens to this podcast, the- mate. It's just me and you. So just 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 tell, tell us your heart. <laughs> I'd like to have them around while I get to know them, and particularly if I'm going to be handing over client relationships to them. Um, through a collaborative process, I'm going to want to get to know them personally. And I think you do that better being in the same place than you do by video. So Zoom or Teams is a whole lot better than just voice, but I don't think it replaces being in the same place for some periods of time. I haven't got a prescribed correct amount of time, but some time together. Before this uh, interview, we, um, we had a chat and I sort of said, well, you know, are you looking for uh, more people to join your group? And you said, no, I'm looking for the right type of people, mm-hmm. okay? And I said that, um, well, this is a great opportunity to outline what that actually buddy means because, um, you know, we're, we're trying to relay that. So what I like to ask people is what makes someone join your business mm-hmm. um, going forward in particular? Um, why do they stay and how do they grow? So what kind of person from an advisor perspective would be joining a business like yours? Probably going to start by taking it back a little bit. When I was looking for a business to be an investor in, I was looking for people who actually got it from my perspective that the product is advice. Got it. Fee for advice. If the advice isn't worth it, don't pay for it. It's not going to be product sales, volume of funds under management, it's going to be success in providing advice and clearly being paid for it. Our tagline of Priority Advisory Group is your future, our priority. The thing we used to say in a few more words was, I know I joined this industry because I wanted to bring my knowledge that I already had and that I was rapidly adding to bear, to make people's lives better working with me than without me. And in the business, we've long said words along the lines of everyone in this business is looking to make a difference in the lives of the clients. The sort of people we're looking for are people that think that way. Yep. And people who join us and stay think that way. And when we're looking for cultural alignment in acquisitions, that's the sort of thing that we're listening for more than anything else. And we've been very lucky, I think, to have um, to have found. Well, oh, flip it. What are red flags? What are red flags? I think client-based Full of perhaps marginal clients, and by that I mean like some of the things that were highlighted by the Royal Commission. You know, someone that doesn't have a lot of money and an average salary being scaled up through leverage to make a bigger client. Yep, I'd be worried about that. Yep. If you get to attend 
and it's a good idea to client meetings with someone that's coming in that already is working with clients, just seeing what the nature of those interactions is. I think being allowed in due diligence to look through the communications that an advisor has with clients will give you insight as to as to the nature of the of the relationship. Anything that looks transactional will be a red flag. Right. So this is communications both from the house and from then specifically, the way in which it's it's framed. Yep. Um and with your when when people come on board, um do you have a career path for people to move into advice from power planning administration in the same way you did? Or are you at this stage specialising in just bringing in um, planners from an uh, inorganic perspective? A lot of the uh, bringing people in has been in support roles, so operational support roles, whereas the advisor roles have generally, apart from a bit of retirement style turnover, been relatively steadier. So... It's hard to be definitive about that. Because I think about your journey and, and uh, at the moment you're outsourcing your power planning. So imagine that they outsourced power planning back when you were power planning. You <laughs> this would be a very short interview. Um, but, yes. And, and, and in, re- in reality, that's a, um, you know, one of the, the difficulties with being in a small to medium-sized business, let's say you're a medium-sized business, is that it's bloody hard to take someone – from and do the entire professional year program all the way through. It's quite a large burden on otherwise not a massive scale business yeah. like a bank. And it's probably one of the biggest, uh, yes, the Royal Commission and, and FOFA uh, has played out, but that's one of the unintended consequences is that you, you, we're not having a, a conveyor belt of 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 people who have the requirements. Yeah, it's true. And I think that if the normal sort of career succession was, you know, come into a client support role of some sort, maybe learning how to implement advice. Therefore, you're reading the advice, the rationale for it and implementing it, having some contact with uh, with clients from a, you know, factual information or question or investigation perspective might have been a good place to start. An interest in power planning may have led to power planning. We never required that sort of progression. But someone who is a great power planner isn't necessarily a great advisor. And if you don't have to be an advisor to be a business owner and to succeed, then maybe just specialise. Can I, can I defend the para planners who are listening? Uh, some planners <laughs> don't make very good plan writers either. Oh, so. <laughs> oh it goes both. It goes both ways, absolutely. And it's, I'm glad you pointed that out. I didn't want to be unfair. I, did, I didn't. I don't think. I don't think. I think unfairly about that. But I. It's become it has become more specialized, I guess. So the recruitment has been for the role that's been needed. We need a power planner, let's find a power planner. Uh it's we need someone in a support role, let's let's find someone right. that wants to be in a support role. The conversation will usually be around what are my opportunities for succession here. Yep. And while we can't promise a time based succession, we will promise to create the opportunity. Uh, and we do genuinely do try to create the opportunity as soon as it can arise. But the the increased specialization does make that a little trickier, but the desire hasn't gone away. It does. And so if I'm working in, in your, your business, a um, couple of questions I've got. Um, uh, being in Sydney, you've obviously got to have competitive salaries, right? Or else no one would join. It's a, it's a tough place to pay to rent or, or have a mortgage. But do you have things like um, uh, targets for, for the group? And like, do you have those sorts of incentives, or, or, or how does it operate? Yeah. There's something on the cards. Yeah, um, th- there are incentives at each level in the in the business. So, uh, so business profitability can result in bonuses for people in support roles, or if it was in house, then for power planning. Yep. Uh, advisors can be rewarded for the rate of new business they bring in, as well as the business that they retain. Yeah. It's never one. It's well, sorry, it's never all new. Yeah, um, got it. It's, uh, it. it's retention as well. Um, and then there is the ability, if the capacity is there, the desire is there, is also to be an investor and to benefit uh, by being an investor and helping the business to succeed. But if a person simply wants to be an employee, not an investor, yep. then they can be successful in terms of being paid correctly for the role that they have. And we've always said, don't let money be the issue. If we, if we find the right people, just get that bit right. Yep. Uh, and then allow the rewards thing to 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 genuinely um, respond to, to to success. So, 
you've got some levers there. You've got some levers around. I do like the fact that you know ad- advisors can control revenue, um, but operations people can very much control profitability. Right? What's the, mm-hmm. the cost of delivery? Cost of goods. So I do like that. You've got a, a potential pathway to ownership for people, as you say, who want to be owners. And as as an existing owner, you only want people who want to be owners, right? You don't enforce it on people. Um, and um, other, there are other facets of why people join uh, businesses, and in particularly, uh, well, I'm not going to create a generational thing here, but but increasingly, as clients want more ESG, team members want more ESG as well. And one facet of that is. What does a company that is successful do in relation to charitable and givings and whatnot? Your business has a long, long and well documented track record on 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 what you support. But in in twenty twenty four, how how do you structure who you pick? Um, how do you structure what what where are you today as far as that? Because um, it's been a very important part of your legacy. It has been. The focus on charity has been there for quite a long time and it ultimately led to our former CEO moving into charity full time and, and, and out of the business. Amazing, yep. So the, the, the focus is still there. It's different. Uh, but we do spend a full day, all of us involved in a selected charity that is generally selected out of the team, someone that they know um, through personal experience or their own networks, uh, spend a day with them. And then there is another day made available for uh, a charitable Involvement of um, of the individuals choosing, and I've, on your website you've got, and so you're saying that that the individuals in the team can nominate charities, and the company's also got some that you've got an affinity towards. Is that right? Just through the network, yes. There are people that we that we know. Not every charity, I guess, can take on a big team to spend a day yep. with them. But yep. um, things like making meals, you know, making sandwiches, doing that sort of thing for uh, for, for some of the you know homeless or, or otherwise disadvantaged. Uh, has been uh, has been something that's been done by a whole team before because they they can take that sort of scale. Uh, so finding the sort of charity that can benefit from our desire to be involved really yep. is on even if it's just for a day to understand uh, as well as to contribute, but then space to um, to be able to um, you know provide some support to causes that we might want to support individual. Thank you. So you've got this uh, this business. You've you've got. Uh, the rigor of a capital partner um, uh, checks and balances every every reporting period. In the probable eventuality that you have a successful year, how do you have fun? Well, there are we do have quarterly team meetings which involve a, a, a fun um, activity of of some sort. Yep. yep. Um, we've done some things like um, I don't know whether you've ever seen that kind of bubble soccer. Um, we had a bowling day uh, once upon a time. We had a laser tag thing. It's always good to shoot this. It's a, <laughs> the, the, the compliance person normally cops it. Um, is my, my gut feel? But well, uh, the deadliest person would have been the one you least expected. But uh, <laughs> oh, okay. there you go. There you go. It's a, it's it's a very it's just it's about having fun together. Yeah, yeah. And you know, twenty years be- you were in business twenty years before you joined financial planning. You've now been in business twenty years in financial planning, almost twenty one years from mm-hmm. video mind. So you've been around, okay. Um, as I intimated earlier, you would have made a great client for someone 20 years ago in the financial planning um, uh, profession, but with a close, a, a sliding door moment, you, made, you, you decided to move into it. You're in a business that um, started off with a life insurance bent. You've now got four pillars of speciality, being the, the private wealth, uh, the insurance, the aged care, and the workplace uh, benefits. I'm wanting to ask, and you, you, in addition to that, You've got an engine room run by a couple of capable uh, women who've got their pillars and what they're doing. You've got scale, but what's the vision for the future? Because you're both the firm that is that has scale, but also speciality. Where do you see the vision of the future for the advice delivery types of business models? I think that the main engine of growth is going to be those specialties. So aged care is a growing need. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, we found ourselves doing it by necessity and developed a specialty in it because we recognized the growing need. And do you just get it could existing just clients or, or people come specifically for aged care? So people do now come specifically for aged care. There are some referral partners in aged care um, facilities, people like admissions offices and, and, that, uh, and the like. It does more often come out of the client base where a parent or partner has an identified need. So we do not 
do we don't try to do everything as advisors we don't try to do everything because that's a, a a specialty of its of its own that that needs deep knowledge just as life insurance is i think that's going to be a growth area not just because of the aging population but because it's being recognized as an area where people do benefit from getting advice around how am i going to finance the care what sort of care is available yep. where is it what's it like all of those all of those sorts of things that are that are critical families who are in a traumatic situation, um, are just looking for some for some clarity. And it, and it, only, takes, from the it advice. only takes a broken hip for for mum to go from being completely independent to requiring aged care. That's the the tragedy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, the the primary driver, I guess, that we see is is dementia. It's people didn't used to live that long. Now they do, and it, uh, it's something that we see increasingly. Uh, and it means that people cannot live independently even if they want to, and it's a difficult situation for families to deal with. And how do you see then for within your business, you're at a scale where you've got specialisation. Mm-hmm. You mentioned referral partners. I've had practices on here before that are in financial planning and receive referrals from other financial planners mm-hmm. where they might, for instance, occasionally get an aged care they might refer or they might refer life insurance or something like that. Do you see that ecosystem continuing? Um, or, or do you see more super firms trying to do everything? I think that there is room for and likely continuation of referring to a firm that has a specialty. So within our firm, I've referred to a life insurance specialist. As I say, have the risk conversation, get the expertise involved in delivering the advice. And on the handoff handover, sorry to interrupt, on the handoff handover, because um, how do you brief? And, and, and when the client... Um, starts working with that specialist. Do does it is it feel more like a medical experience where they've been you, you've kind of done the general practitioner and you've referred them for this person to do this particular operation or what? What's the vibe? Wherever we can, we meet jointly. Okay, so we would pre-brief. How did this arise? What's the conversation been to date? And where to from here? Should the conversation go? And so it's a it's a joint meeting, whenever it can be. Uh, sometimes it's a handover to the specialist, but by and large, and it's better when it's a, when it's a joint meeting. So I could see if I was one of a couple of advisors just like me who recognises the importance of life insurance but doesn't have the time, appetite, or strong desire to really know it deeply, then I would be looking for a firm of specialists that I could refer to because I think it's a terrible thing to get wrong. Well, it's I mean ethically, it's a terrible thing to get wrong, but. Um, from a licensing and, and compliance and, and, and repercussion, it is it is a, a big, big issue. Yeah. Well, if someone has a claim, you want it paid. So you want to do all that you can to make sure that that's going to be the experience if it comes to that. Yeah. So I would not want to, I guess, do it at a, at a surface level. The same goes for aged care. Um, I have managed through a couple of family circumstances, but I wouldn't have wanted to sit down and try to advise someone on all aspects of aged care without a without a deep specialty. Uh, workplace financial advice, I have had some involvement in the past. I, I have worked under the under the old model. I haven't worked uh, the way it is now, but that that is also capable of growth. Yep. So workplace benefits, why shouldn't they include here's how to get the benefit out of the super fund that you're joining as you join us as an employee? Well, why, why isn't there a benefit in saying we've got a group salary continuance plan here that might get you some cover that would otherwise be difficult. And there are people who will help you if you need a claim. Those those sorts of things, I think, um, uh, are still growth areas. But then if you're getting to know private clients, they've got friends, they've got family, they've got networks of sorts. Somewhere along the line, conversations arise as to, you know, I've got this situation. Have you ever seen it? And who do you talk to? And we get to know people's accountants as well because yeah. we're generally checking in on tax aspects of yeah. um, of the advice we, we may want to give or their tax life as it is now as an insight. We get to know those people and if they gain confidence in us, then they will identify an advice need and uh, and, and make an introduction. So um, you've now, you've, you've, you're married to de facto partner. You guys are working together. Um, you, 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 how long has that been for? Just under a year. Under a year. So the honeymoon period's almost over. The de facto period was for a little longer. Okay, okay. The honeymoon <laughs> period's all, 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 always finished. Um, is your firm looking to grow um, your team members from an operational perspective or an advisor perspective um, uh, in the next year or so? 
I think that the desire for scale is is there. As you mentioned before, there's been a rationalization in the industry. There are just not as many of us as there used to be. I think it will become, or maybe it's under way of becoming a desirable career path for young people with finance degrees and wanting to do a PY, but it's got a way to go, I think. It's yeah. just a personal opinion. I don't have stats on that. Well, I think we're in purgatory. <laughs> I mean, it's one side of the ledger says that there's this outrageous demand. Yeah. The other side of the ledger says that that um, we haven't quite got the economic model to bring those people through. Well, I'm proud to say that you know part of Ensemble's reason for being is 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 assisting and scaffolding the solution to the latter. So I think that people like people like me are going to need to see more clients. Yep, um, they're going to be able to be they're going to need to be efficient in delivering the advice that the client came to see. So scale will help to meet the need. So bigger firms with greater efficiencies, I think, are a big part of the solution. We don't have, as far as I'm aware, not being on the board these days, a particular size in mind, but being a business of scale is uh, is definitely an objective, which is part of the reason we have grown the way we the way we have. And I don't see that that's finished, but I'm not sure what the next step will be. Okay. Well, the thing about um, financial planning practices is that we're we, we, on this tightrope of needing to charge our clients the amount of money to make it a viable proposition whilst at the same time not completely alienating every facet or every every demographic of client, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's a that's a, a an issue that's that's um, across every single practice. Um, I'd like to take the time. Um, th- first of all, thanks thanks David for coming in on your de facto day off. I think you. Um, <laughs> I, I do like the fact that you your firm has um, you are a couple of you are going back the days. Mm-hmm. I think. That having a steady and professional um, transition also just leaves your clients way better off. Yeah, I mean, you've you mentioned throughout this podcast that you've had scenarios um, for whatever reason where it's been rushed. Um, some advert, some some could be controlled, some couldn't, um, and that that hasn't been that hasn't been the best outcome for clients. But you know, um, right now they're in steady hands with yourself. Um, I'd like to thank um, you for spending the time. Uh, for giving a shout out to uh, your, your licensee, your capital partner, and for being part of the the ensemble community, because we're all about the positive evolution of financial advice, which can only exist if there are good practices that people work in. So, on behalf of myself, thanks very much for today. It's my pleasure. Thank you too, and I hope that it's a useful contribution. Cheers, mate. <laughs>